أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على مصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the Holy Quran أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون do they assume, do the people assume that they will say, uh, that they will claim to have believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then they won't be tested? This is a question asked by God subhanahu wa ta'ala to confirm that the believers must be tested because the true colors have to show as we said yesterday. Now everyone goes through a test whether he's a believer or a non-believer but the difference is that the believer passes the test, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said yesterday, sometimes will test us through our beliefs, sometimes through our practices, our morals. In the Holy Quran, He has mentioned to us a test that Bani Israel went through. And that was the test of the Samari and the Kalf. To understand what happened and what drove Bani Israel to actually worship the Kalf after having believed in Allah and Musa alayhi salam, we must understand first what had happened between Musa and the Pharaoh, right? Musa alayhi salam, after coming to the Pharaoh and showing him the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, showing him the staff that turned into a serpent and the blowing hand, uh, Pharaoh did not believe in, in Moses alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent uh, several punishments as signs, number one, of Musa's salaq, of Musa's truthfulness, and at the same time as an, as an alarm clock basically for the Pharaoh. These signs were to wake him up and to wake his people, the, the non-believers, so that they could believe in Musa and believe in the Almighty God subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first Allah azza wa jal afflicted them with drought. And so water was not pouring down, rain was not pouring. And he also afflicted them with the loss of produce, the loss of crops, of fruits. However, the Pharaoh did not believe. He seeked the help of Musa السلام, asking him to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to supplicate and ask God to remove this um, calamity. And, that he, and he promised that he will believe. Musa alayhi salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the calamity. And the only thing we saw is that the Pharaoh disbelieved in God subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next, Allah azza wa jal afflicted them with a new tragedy, with a new punishment. As he says, فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمُ الطُّوفَانِ وَالْجَرَادَ وَالْقُمَّنَ وَالْضَفَادِعَ وَالْدَمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted them with several punishments. The first one is a tufan. Haman, who is one of the main workers for Pharaoh, he addressed the Pharaoh, telling him to imprison anyone who has believed in Musa السلام, because he realized that Musa was a danger to their rulership, to their ruling. So the narration says that Pharaoh imprisoned all those from Bani Israel who had believed in Musa And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted him with a tufan. Now there are different opinions on what is this tufan, what actually took place. One opinion says it is a flood. Allah azza wa jal afflicted them with floods. The water destroyed their homes, it ruined their houses. And so they had to live outside the city. But of course, the water only afflicted the people of Pharaoh. It did not touch Banu Israel. It did not touch the believers. And this in itself was a sign. So we have two signs in one, Tufan, and also that Bani Israel were not being afflicted with the flood. Now, they turned to Musa, telling him, O oh Musa, pray to your Lord, ask him, 
to remove this calamity and we will give you Bani Israel because as you know the Pharaoh he had enslaved the children of Israel when we say children of Israel we mean who? we mean the descendants of Jacob Yaqub because he is known as Israel and so anyone who comes from the lineage of Jacob from the lineage of his 12 sons among them is Yusuf and Bani Amin he is considered to be from Bani Israel so Pharaoh told Musa I will, I will set Bani Israel free, you can take them. I will, I will set them free. Just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the tufan, to remove the flood. Musa alayhi salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The flood was removed, now they disbelieved again. They showed disbelief another time. So Allah ta'ala afflicted them with a second tragedy. And as I said, this, is what, this was used as an alarm clock for Pharaoh, is to wake him up. Because as we've said before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives His slaves many chances to come back, to repent. So you realize this arrogant Pharaoh, who used to claim that he is the God of this universe, he himself is God, and that people should prostrate to him, Allah ta'ala gave him many chances before destroying him once and for all. The second punishment was in Jarad, where Allah Ta'ala sent a massive number of locusts, these huge grasshoppers that fly in masses. So they came and they began eating the crops of Pharaoh and his people. They ate the vegetation, they ate the crops, they were even snatching the beards of, of people, the, the, the narration says. they were taking off their hairs, and so they caused a lot of pain. Again, the Pharaoh and his people, they cried to Musa alayhi salam, O Musa, save us. Ask Allah Ta'ala to remove the punishment. Musa asks Allah to remove it. After Allah removes it, they disbelieve again. Now, there are two opinions here. One opinion says that these punishments were happening year after year. So there was a gap of a year between each punishment. Another opinion says no, it was month after month. Nonetheless, the next punishment was wal qumman. And here there's, there are differences among the scholars on what God means by qumman. Qumman has been interpreted to be lice. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He punished them with, with lice and there was a lot of lice coming on, the, on their hairs, on their clothing and they were getting irritated by the lice. Another opinion says al qummal is a small grasshopper. At, the, at first, God punishes them with the locust. Now with a small grasshopper that comes and eats everything around. It ate the vegetation with its roots. And so, again, they turn to Musa salam, telling him, oh Musa, ask Allah to remove this punishment and we will set Bani Israel free. Musa asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the punishment. Again, they disbelieved in God. Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them the fadia, the frogs. A massive number of, of frogs entered Egypt and they were found everywhere. They would be found in the food, in the drinks, in the pots, anywhere people or the people of Pharaoh would be present, they would be there. It, said, it is said that when one of them wanted to eat, as he's about to take a bite from his food, the frog comes and beats him to his food. It snatches the food away from him. When he's about to open his mouth to talk, the frog jumps into his mouth. So the frogs were distur disturbing Pharaoh and his people. Again, they turned to Musa. Ya Musa, pray to Allah. And we will believe, pray to Allah, we'll give you Bani Israel. Again, Musa salam, pray to God subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they disbelieve. Last but not least, Allah sent the final sign, which was a dam, blood. And here the Nile River, this humongous river, was turned into blood. The beautiful thing about this miracle, the amazing aspect of this miracle is that the water that was shared 
by Bani Israel and the people of the Pharaoh, and by, by Bani Israel and the Coptics. It was water for the Israelites, but it was blood for the Coptics. In other words, if you were from Bani Israel, you take, out, you take water and you'll, you'll be able to drink it. It will remain water. As for the Coptics, if they wanted to drink, it would be blood. It is even said that it, the, um, the circumstances were becoming so hard that a Coptic went and addressed a, a person from Bani Israel. And he told him, place water in your mouth. And then pour it into my mouth because he wants to drink. So the, 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 the narration says, as the water is coming out of the mouth of the person from Bani Israel, it turns into blood and goes into the mouth of the Coptic. So there was a, a, a strong punishment set by God subhanahu wa ta'ala upon, upon sorry, the Coptics, Pharaoh, and his people. They were eating blood, they were drinking blood, for a whole week. Again, they turned to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Musa, help us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the punishment. Musa again asked God subhanahu wa ta'ala, but still they disbelieved. What does the Quran say? It says, Ayatin mufassalat fastakbaru wa kanu qawman mushrimin. We've sent them clear signs, one sign after the other, but they were arrogant, they were criminals, they were sinners, and they did not submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to his commands. Now, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, after years passed, Musa was ordered by God to take Bani Israel and to leave Egypt. So now Musa alayhi alayhi, is about to leave. And he was about to leave secretly because he doesn't want the Pharaoh to know. As he's about to leave, alayhi salam, when the Banu Israel are pre preparing themselves, they're about to leave. Uh, uh, Musa is told to take with him the body of Joseph, alayhi salatu salam. Yusuf was buried in Egypt. And so Allah Ta'ala wanted him to remove the body from Egypt and to take it back to Yusuf's homeland, salam alayhi to be buried with his forefathers. So now Musa, he wanted to see a person who knew where was Joseph buried. It appeared there was an old lady who knew, an old lady from Bani Israel. And this old lady, she's very interesting when you think about her because you'll see what she requests from Musa alayhi salam. Musa comes up to her, asking her for Yusuf's grave. Where is the grave of Yusuf alayhi salam? Of course, you should know by now that when a prophet asks a question, it doesn't mean he doesn't know, right? Because Allah Ta'ala asks a question in the Quran, Allah knows everything, but he asks Musa, tells him, oh Musa, what's in your right hand? It was his staff. Now, God doesn't know that, <laughs> that Musa is holding a staff in his right hand. It makes no sense. So when a person asks a question, it doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't know what he's asking about. But there's a reason behind it. His question. So now, Musa asks her, where is the, the body of Yusuf alayhi salam? She tells him, I'll tell you, but I have conditions. The first condition is that you have to restore my legs and make me able to walk. She was very old. Okay, sounds reasonable till now. She tells him, I want you to make me young again. She was very old. She wants to be a youth again. Also reasonable until now. She tells him, I want you to, to make me able to see again. She was blind. She wanted her sight, her eyesight to return. Now the last request is the hard one, or the, the most important request, the heavy request. She tells him, I want to be with you in heaven. Musa alayhi salam asks her. He tells her, you want to be in heaven? She says, no, I want to be with you in heaven. Realize? There's a difference between entering heaven and being in heaven with the prophets, with the Imams I want to be in heaven with you, Kareemullah, the person who spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeing that her request was very heavy, Musa turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, complaining to him of what she requested, and Allah answered back to grant her whatever she requested. 
So he gave her what she requested, and she told him uh, where Yusuf والسلام, was buried. Now, they took the body of Yusuf and were about to leave. Now they take the body of Yusuf. Realize that this old lady, she knows what, what she wants to ask from Musa, right? Uh, two lectures ago, we were talking about the night of destiny and how we should know what to ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At times, we really don't know what to ask. I mean, we might name one or two hajat, maybe three or four, and that's it. We don't know what else to ask from God subhanahu wa ta'ala. It would be wise to return to the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt because they know best what to ask from God azza wa jalla. And so return to du'a matiyar al-akhlaq by Imam Zayn al-Abidin. Or to du'a ya huddati. Or to du'a ya huddati and the qurbati for Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam in order to, to know how to speak with God subhanahu wa ta'ala and to know what to ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This old lady asked to be with Musa. You wouldn't think she's going to ask something like that, right? But she understands. She's a, she's a lady with wisdom. And she wants to be saved on day of judgment. So ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not think that sometimes the demand, sometimes the dua is too great for God azza wa jal. For Allah is the all generous. Akram and akramin. And so ask anything from him and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer you. Now Musa alayhi salam was about to leave. The Pharaoh knew that Banu Israel are planning to leave Egypt and he was enraged. So he called the surrounding cities, summoning his, his people to come and gather so that they could fight Banu Israel and finish them once and for all. So he gathered a lot of people and he was about to meet Bani Israel before they were about to cross the sea. The, the narration here says what? It says there were people from Bani Israel who had joined the ranks of the Pharaoh. Why? These are what we call hypocrites, two-faced people. From one perspective, they know Musa salam. But for another, they want to be safe and they're not willing to feel any hardship for their religion. And so they thought to themselves, if Musa actually dies, if Musa is caught by the Pharaoh and killed by the Pharaoh, we're going to be killed with him. So let's take the safe side. We'll remain with the Pharaoh. If the Pharaoh is destroyed, then no problem. We'll go back and we'll join Musa now keep this piece of information in mind uh, because we're going to see what's going to happen as Musa السلام, is crossing the sea. Musa, he ends up at the sea. Now, there's a huge sea between him and, and uh, sorry, in front of him and Banu Israel. Pharaoh comes and he's trying to catch Banu Israel before they leave. Now we're told in the narrations, there's a person called Balaam ibn Bahura. Who is this person? Balaam ibn Bahura was also a believer in Musa السلام, and was a great scholar. A scholar that had thousands of scholars learn under his hands. So he would teach thousands of people. And he was a person who had Ismullah al-A'zam, this ultimate great name that if you use, Allah Ta'ala will answer your call that you could use to do miraculous things. Allah gave him a lot of signs. He was a believer in Musa alayhi salam. However, he came to the point where he, where, where he joined the Pharaoh. And he thought that since his dua is mustajab, it's answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can come to the point of supplicating against Musa and Allah will answer his dua. This is what we call blindness. This is what we call arrogance. So now we have a scholar who's respectful, respected in the eyes of the, of the people, who has a mustajab, his dua is mustajab, his, his dua is answered. He thinks that he can defeat 
his own prophet, his own messenger, using the weapon he was taught by his prophet. I mean, how would he know dua if it wasn't for Musa ibn Amran alayhi salam? So he joined the ranks of the Pharaoh and was about to do dua against Musa alayhi salatu salam. Unfortunately, his, his, his ending was not pleasant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed him in very low levels and he used, he gave us an example of this human being in the Quran. What is the example used by God to refer to Bana bin Ba'ura? It is nothing but a dog. Kalb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Mathaluhu kamathalil kalb. This person was like a dog. He lost his status when he turned against the hujjah. When he turned against the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this, there's a big warning and a big lesson for all those scholars, right? That turn against the Ahlul Bayt That turn against the proofs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how knowledgeable you are, you must always respect and submit to the prophets and to the Imams alayhi salam. If you come to a degree where you think your words are superior to the words of the Ahlul Bayt salam, you have fallen down. If you think that you are better than the Ahlul Bayt or the Ahlul Bayt are just normal people, scholars like you, then you have definitely sunk very low. So Musa alayhi salam reached the sea. Now there's a dead end. How is he going to cross? The narration says, Musa alayhi salam asked Banu Israel. He told them to walk on the sea, to walk on the water. Banu Israel refused. How could you ask us to walk on water, right? Of course, it's a miracle. When Musa tells them walk on water, he's truthful. Isa did so, sallallahu But they wouldn't walk on water. Now, one of his awsiya, Musa, the first, his first successor is Joshua, alayhi salam. Yusha bin Nun. His second successor is Caleb ibn Yuhanna, the one after Joshua. One of his two successors, one narration says Joshua, the other one says Caleb. He turned to Musa, he told him, Musa, what do you want from us? Do you want us to cross the sea, to walk on the sea? He told him, yes. He told him, is this an order from God subhanahu wa ta'ala? Musa told him, yes. And so this successor actually walked on the water. As he's walking on the water, he turns back to Bani Israel and he tells them, come, here I am, look at me, I'm on the water, right? My horse, I'm riding my horse on water, I'm not sinking, so come and cross it, but they would not move. And so now Allah Ta'ala orders Musa to do what? To hit the water with his staff. By hitting it with his staff, what happens? The water opens into two. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala makes a pathway for Banu Israel. And here you have two sides of mountains. The Quran refers, refers to them as two great mountains. You could imagine, when the sea is split and you have the water hanging in the air, how uh, terrifying that scene is, right? And how amazing it is. Allah says that the two sides were like two great mountains. Now the Banu Israel, they were told to cross the sea. Still they did not cross. What do they want? They want the pathway to be dry, not to be humid. So Allah Ta'ala sent wind and through the sun rays, he made the pathway dry. Again, they were told, cross the sea. They didn't want to. Why? There are 12 tribes. They come from 12, they are 12 different tribes of Bani Israel. So they said, how could we all cross in one pathway? If we're crossing, some of us are going to advance the others, and then we're gonna have hard feelings, you know, maybe envy or, or anger towards each other. So, we can't cross it. Musa was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again to use his staff in order to make 11 other pathways. And this is the one thing that usually is not mentioned. That it wasn't only one pathway made by Musa. 12 pathways were made in the sea. Musa made 12 pathways. Now they were told to cross the sea. 
Again, they don't want to cross. Ya Banu Israel, what's wrong with you? I mean, if we were there, Allah Alam, what would we do with them, right? But Musa has patience, not like us. So Musa tells them, what's the matter? They tell him that if we cross, we can't see each other. Because there's water in between. We want to see each other. So Musa alayhi salam, again, using, using the, the blessed staff, he kind of makes an opening um, through the water. Or he makes the water clear somehow, through a mu'ajiza, in a way that when they're crossing the sea, they're able to see each other. Jayid? Now finally they start crossing. Musa salam sends Aaron to be the first one, to be the leader, so he can lead Bani Israel. And Musa himself remains behind, waiting for the last person for Bani Israel to cross. Of course, Banu Israel, we're, we're talking about a, a huge number, a very large number of people that are crossing the sea. They were in the hundreds of thousands of people. So it takes time for them to cross. Musa is waiting till the end. Now realize how many miracles Musa has performed. Salam Allah How many miracles they've seen with their own two eyes. And now they're crossing the sea and seeing the water remaining as it is. Now what will drive Banu Israel to become kafir, to become uh, polytheists, disbelievers, shortly after they have crossed the sea? And how can we relate between what happened with Samiri and the Kalf and between our modern days? Inshallah that will be touched upon tomorrow. <laughs> We still have about five minutes. I want to make a, a, um, a very important note concerning the biographies of Prophets uh, There's two things we need to take into consideration before we look into the biographies of the Prophets of God. The first one, the first point, is that there has been an attempt to deform the true pictures, the true figures of the Prophets of God السلام, throughout history. And thus you realize if you look at the Old Testament or the New Testament, you will see that the Prophets of God are viewed to be sinners, some are viewed to be wine drinkers, others are rude to their mothers, some, a'udhu billah, um, they commit adultery with their daughters, some, a'udhu billah, wrestle with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there was a huge attempt, big attempt, to deform the true figures, the true uh, reality of these prophets of God, the true characters of the prophets Gratefully, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed their real characters in the Holy Quran. As you see in the, in the Quran, the true prophets, the true characters of the prophets are presented. And this is an, actually one of the miraculous aspects of the Quran. Why is it a miraculous aspect? Because first and foremost, the person that brought forth the Quran is unschooled. Prophet Muhammad did not learn under anyone's hands. He didn't have any private lessons or public lessons. He never learned in any school. Secondly, apparently he did not learn how to read or write. So if he were a normal human being, we can say he doesn't know how to read or write, right? However, since he was a prophet of God, Allah had given him the knowledge of how to read and write. And Allah Ta'ala here brought forth the Quran through the hands of Muhammad. Now if we, if we were not believing in Muhammad, what do we see? We see a human being who's unschooled, doesn't know how to read or write according to our assumption. He brings forth the stories of prophets السلام, that have been mentioned in the Torah, in the Bible. And these stories are, number one, accurate. And number two, they're perfect. There are no errors in these stories. When you read the Old Testament or the New Testament and you look into the, the life of Adam, for example, or the life of Noah. There is some truth in it, but it's always mixed with falsehood. So when you're reading, you're, you're gonna be like, no, this, I cannot accept this. this, this doesn't make sense. As an example, I'll give you an example. Adam in the Old Testament, 
Um, after he sins, right? He does his sin and he eats from the tree, according to what they say. We say he didn't sin. But according to what the Jews say, he sinned. Allah Ta'ala is walking in heaven looking for Adam. Saying, Adam, where are you? Now, can I accept this when I'm reading it? Can I accept it? Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala knows everything and sees everything. Is he in need of asking Adam, Adam, where, where are you hidden? In which, you know, in which bush? Where are you, Adam? This doesn't make sense. Also, we're told in the Old Testament that God did not want Adam to approach the tree. For what reason? Because he doesn't want him to know what's good and bad. Now, let's think about this for a little bit. If I don't know what's good and bad, and God is telling me, don't approach the tree, do I know that it's bad to approach the tree? I don't. Because I don't know what's good and bad. So there's no reason, there's no wisdom behind God telling me don't come near the tree because I don't even know it's bad. I don't know what's good and bad, right? So the story doesn't make sense when, when it tells you in the Old Testament, Adam approached the tree, he sinned, and, and God didn't want him to go near the tree because he doesn't want him to know what's good and bad. It makes absolutely no sense. You come to the Quran, the true story is presented. You come to Noah, to Ibrahim, to Musa, to Isa, to all these different prophets. You see that the Quran presents them as perfect human beings. Now, if Muhammad was an ordinary person, an, an unschooled human being, a person who doesn't know how to read and write, number one, how did he know about these prophets? And number two, how was he able to present their stories, stories that are flawless? Stories that are perfect. And so this is one of the miraculous aspects of the Quran. However, when I come to the Quran and I, re and, and I read it, I always need to go back to the Ahlul Bayt salam, to understand the verses correctly. Because the Quran has two types of verses. It has muhkam verses and mutashabah verses. What's the difference? The muhkamat are those verses that are very clear and the meaning is apparent. When you, when you read the verse, you understand the meaning, such as the verse that says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very clear. Mutashabah verses, mutashabihat, it's a verse that, that, has, that, that, that can hold multiple meanings. But the meanings are contradicting. It means either this or that. It can't mean both. As an example, the verse that says, Yadullah fawqa aydihim. It's saying literally, the hand of God is over their hands. Okay? Now, let's try to think how many meanings can we deduce from this verse. The first meaning is the meaning that, that Ibn Taymiyyah will deduce. And the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah. And that is that God's physical hand is over their hands, right? That's the first meaning. The second meaning is, no, the hand of Rasulullah was over their hands. But Rasulullah being the messenger of Allah, being Habibullah, it was as if God's hand was over their hands. Okay? That's the second meaning. So it's either this or that. We can't accept both because they contradict. So now how do we know what the mutashabih verses mean. How do we come to the right meaning? The Quran gives us a very simple and general rule. It says use the muhkamat verses. When you use the muhkamat, the ones that are clear, the mutashabihat, the meaning of the mutashabihat will be clear. Also there's another way that the, also the Quran mentioned. The Quran told you that those who know the initial meaning, the primary meaning of the mutashabihat verse, verses are Allah and al-rasikhuna fil-alim. Rasikhun fil-alim are those that are firm in knowledge. Who are those people? The Ahlul Bayt So if you want someone. So if you want to know the meaning of the mutashabihat verses, you need to go back to the Ahlul Bayt and they will clarify for you, right? Now, so let me just complete the first point and then maybe the second point, I'll leave it till tomorrow, inshallah. 
Understanding that the, we take the biographies of the prophets from the Quran, we also use the Ahlul Bayt السلام, their narrations, to, um, to learn about the biographies of the prophets. However, what's unfortunate is that although the Quran was not attacked, no one was able to alter it. However, the narrations were attacked. And there were narrations that were fabricated against the Imams. There were narrations that the Imam said in the state of Taqiyah, in the state where he's in danger, and he had to say it, but he doesn't mean it, right? And so when you're looking to the Ahadith of the Ahad al-Bayt, you have to be very careful in what you, what, what you pick and choose, right? and what you consider to be a correct narration and an incorrect narration. People like us, we don't have the ability to do that. We need to leave that work for who? To Ahl al-Khibra, the people who experience, the scholars, who will be able to distinguish between the right narrations and the wrong narrations. Last but not least, what I'm presenting for you in these lectures is a very small glimpse of information concerning the Prophet or don't, don't um, understand from my words that this is the only thing we have about them. No, there's a lot of information about prophets, especially if you look back into the book Bihar al-Anwar, you're going to see an ocean of narrations con concerning the, their biographies. And so I encourage you to take a look at those narrations so that you have a better understanding of what happened with the prophets of God, هذا والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على مصطفى محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآله محمد